I look forward to seeing this. I'm a big fan of the original, and I watched it again just a few months ago. It really holds up. I thought, okay, there's enough here to revisit. Unfortunately, this is the worst movie I have seen in a long time. Now I'm going to spoil the entire thing for you so you don't need to waste your time. The movie starts off in the mythical African country of Wakanda. Just kidding. Zamunda. We catch up to Prince Eddie. He's still happily married to Lisa. They have three daughters who love them. And they are loved by the entire country. We see a sparring session between the prince and his oldest daughter, who is next in line for the throne. The film establishes quite well, in my opinion, that she is a bit of a badass. She is regal, and I believe she can hold her own in a fight. Especially against her father. I'm pretty sure Eddie's next project will be a reboot of The Clumps. It's here we come to the first problem of the movie. The only reason the princess is next in line for the throne is because Prince Eddie has no sons. According to law, she cannot rule. And look, I think this is a very worthwhile theme to explore, but don't shoehorn it in as a subplot. It just feels empty. If it really meant that much to them, here's what the premise of the movie could have been. King Eddie tells his daughter, you are next in line for the throne, but by law, you cannot rule. You must marry. By the end of the film, King Eddie sees the error of his ways and changes the law so she can rule the country in her own right. In the meantime, the princess says, okay, fine. If I have to marry, I will find a husband of my own. I will do as you did. I will go to Queens and find a man. And sure, that would have made this an all-female rehash of the original, but this movie is rehash anyway. And I guarantee this very idea crossed their minds at some point. But they saw how well that worked out recently and decided not to take the risk. The problem, though, is not women. The problem is rehashing movies that don't need to be rehashed. But I guess it's okay that this is a pointless, worthless, unasked-for sequel to a movie that did not need one, because later in the movie, our two protagonists talk openly about pointless, worthless, unasked-for sequels to movies that didn't need one. Meta! Well, back to the story. All is not well in Zamunda. A small, heavily armed group from a neighboring country storms the castle and demands an audience with the prince. We learn there is a shaky truce between these two countries, and I really hope it never comes to war, because these guys storm the castle without a problem. Probably because they have guns, and in Zamunda they have sticks. And now we meet the military dictator of that country next door, General Wesley. The name of that country next door, by the way, is Next Doria. Ugh. Listen, I like dad jokes, but was that really the best they could do? General Wesley holds a grudge because the prince was supposed to form lasting peace between their countries by marrying the general's sister. She's the one from the first movie that Prince Eddie told to hop on one leg and bark like a dog. 30 years later, she's still doing it. Why? She's not one of his subjects. She only followed his orders because he was going to marry her. Does she really have to wait for him to st tell her to stop? Did he forget about her? If so, why doesn't he tell her now? He will tell her by the end of the movie, is that part of his character arc? General Wesley has a new plan, to marry his son to the princess. But the princess is not interested, and the prince does not want to force her, so it looks like war is inevitable. But good news. Thanks to magic, which is a real thing, Prince Eddie finds out he has a bastard son in Queens. But how can that be? Prince Eddie never slept with anyone except Lisa. Turns out, before he met Lisa, Leslie Jones drugged him, and she gets pregnant while he hallucinates he's being attacked by a wild boar. If you don't see a problem with this, imagine the reverse scenario. Prince Eddie drugs Leslie, impregnates her while she's hallucinating, and the next day she wakes up with no memory, but pregnant. But nah, this is just silly fun. See, sure, it's rape, but it's funny because it's a guy. It's annoying because it's unnecessary. They could have just said, hey, Prince Eddie had a one-night stand before he met Lisa. End of story. But no, they don't want to do that. They don't want to say, no, the prince was pure. He never slept with anyone or did anything before he met Lisa. This makes no sense. There are men and women whose job it is to bathe members of the royal family. It's heavily implied that the service includes a happy ending. It's a running joke in the first movie and in this movie. 
But I guess it's true what they say. Prostitution does not count. Anyway, thanks to magic, Prince Eddie gets a sketch of what his son looks like today. And the prince knows he should go to Queens to find his son. But before he can do that, there is a death ceremony for the king, who is still alive but appears on stage standing in a coffin. Conveniently, in the middle of a ceremony and mid-conversation with his son, the prince, the king dies in the most unconvincing death scene I have seen on film ever. I fully expected him to open his eyes and say, nah, I'm just fucking with you. But no, he's dead. I guess rigor mortis set in immediately because he doesn't fall down. Prince Eddie is now King Eddie, and he rushes off to Queens to find his son. But we meet Eddie Jr. before he does, here being interviewed for a job by Upper Class White Twit of the Year. Upper Class Twit tells Eddie Jr. he has heard that when black men grow up without fathers, that can have serious consequences. This is played for a laugh, because everyone knows that's just something that they say, and it's total bullshit. And it might be, I'm not going to argue that. But I am interested in what effect it had on Eddie Jr., because later in the film, Eddie Jr. tells someone else that he dreamed often about the day his father would come and take him away from Queens. So it had an effect, it had no effect. We'll never know, because the film doesn't go any deeper than this. King Eddie and Simi arrive in Queens, and the neighborhood has changed a lot from, from the war zone it was in the first film. There's a quick joke made about gentrification, but no deeper commentary. But one thing is still exactly the same, the barbershop from the first film. The men inside haven't changed either. They were ancient in the first film. It's been 30 years. I have a theory. Eddie stopped by back when he was a vampire in Brooklyn and turned them all into daywalkers. I'm not going to argue on whether or not it is PC for a black man to wear makeup and prosthetics to become an old Jewish man. Apparently the general consensus is that if a black person wears old Jew face, that is kicking up, or at least kicking laterally. King Eddie shows the men the sketch of his son, and fortunately there are so few black men living in New York City, they know exactly who he is, exactly where he is at that exact moment. So King Eddie rushes to meet his son, and then follows him home to meet his mother. And after a scene that is somehow both rushed and too long, Eddie Jr. is convinced to come to Zamunda, but only if he can bring his mother with him. They return to Zamunda, and the king tells the queen he had gone to America to find his bastard son. And this is absolutely news to the queen. She didn't even notice he was gone. Which I suppose makes sense, because as far as the film is concerned, the trip between Zamunda and Queens takes five minutes. It must be that sweet Wakanda tech. But the queen says it's okay that he was with another woman before her. After all, she was with other men before him. And this is played repeatedly for a laugh, as he's confused. What do you mean, other men? What are you talking about? I guess it's been a while since he saw the first film. How did he forget Daryl? Daryl wasn't just a rival for Lisa's affections. They were in a relationship. They were going to get married. We cut over to Nextoria. Ugh and we see the military training in their wacky ways. And we see General Wesley reading a book to his child soldiers, because child soldiers in Africa are certainly worth parody. Meanwhile, Eddie Jr. is adjusting to life in the palace, and he's approached for the first time by the royal bathers. He's into it, but he's nervous, so he runs ahead into the bathing room to talk to his mother, who he somehow knows is there. And they have a long conversation where she encourages him to take advantage of their services, right there in front of her. And I saw those bubbles and I thought, hmm, I bet she's being seen to right now. But I thought, nah, they wouldn't be that obvious with a joke. Besides, would she really want to have a long conversation with her son while her vagina was being cleaned? And that's exactly what was happening. You know, a key element of humor is surprise. The only surprise about this movie, besides the mild themes of incest, is how little time they spend in America. So Eddie Jr. gets serviced in front of his mother and then meets the royal barber. They have a make-cute conversation, and you know within five seconds that these two characters will end up together. But it can't happen yet, because General Wesley shows up with a new peace plan. You know, for a warlord, this guy has one hell of a hard-on for peace. He wants to marry his daughter to the new prince. But Queen Lisa is not happy here, and I don't understand why. This means peace between their countries, her daughter is off the hook, 
and she doesn't even really seem to like Eddie Jr. very much. Not to mention the fact that Eddie Jr. is totally down with this. Especially after his mother encourages him to tear that ass up. I guess she's looking forward to being in the room while he consummates the marriage. But it can't happen yet. First, A Jr. must pass a series of tests to officially become the prince. And now we get into a chunk of the film that, like the film itself, is long, boring, unfunny, and in the end, useless. But at least it starts off with a montage of footage from the original film, which becomes the best part of this film. They include Samuel L. Jackson's scene from the first movie here, and it's really a shame they didn't get him for this one. It would be really cool to see him that, like the neighborhood itself, he had cleaned himself up and become successful. It would have been a great example of art imitating life, because back when he made the first movie, he was actually addicted to heroin. But, oh well. I guess they couldn't afford him. Good thing it only costs a Pepsi to get Louis Anderson. So Eddie Jr. passes all the tests because of course he does, and becomes the prince. They throw him a big party to celebrate. He meets his fiancée. And in a scene reminiscent of the first film, and by reminiscent, I mean nearly word for word, he realizes that his intended is completely devoid of personality and totally subservient. He doesn't want her. He wants the barber. He proposes to her, and they elope to Queens. King Eddie knows this will lead to war, and he rushes after them. He catches up to them in a shithole, and we meet the preacher character from the first film, who did not get bit by Vampire Eddie. I guess that cross got in the way. Meanwhile, back in Zamunda, General Wesley storms the castle once again and demands to see the prince. I love these scenes are happening at the same time, but it's broad daylight in Zamunda and New York City. Zamunda truly is magical. The general orders his men to kidnap the princess, but since they forgot their guns back in Nextoria, ugh, she's able to fight back, but she's outnumbered and nearly loses. Then Simi shows up with her sisters, and honestly when I saw this, I thought Arsenio was appearing as another female character. They win the day, and the princess forces the general to negotiate a new peace treaty. Over in Queens, King Eddie has a change of heart and now supports the marriage, even though he has no idea what his daughter has done to secure peace, as far as he knows, this will now lead to war, but hey, what are massive civilian casualties compared to true love? But now the barber has a change of heart. She doesn't want to be married in Queens. King Eddie has a solution. He will bring Queens to Zamunda, or at least a bunch of characters. They return to Zamunda and the prince gets married, but the king tells the princess that the prince will not be king. He will change the law and make her be queen in her own right, thus rendering the entire movie pointless. I only wish he'd come to this decision long ago because that would save a few hours of my life, not to mention all the time it took to make this. And the movie ends with Sexual Chocolate, who I guess also was not bit by Vampire Eddie. To end on a positive note, I'm sure this movie was a lot of fun to make. And I love seeing Wesley working again. Hope he was paid well, and I hope he pays his taxes. It rekindled my old dream of someday writing a screenplay for him, where his catchphrase is, Hey, write black at ya. But where was Lisa's sister? She was great in the first film. More importantly, where was Daryl? He was the antagonist of the first film. He would have been a great villain in this one. Well, it turns out he was too busy to be in this movie, and that makes me happy. Happy for his sake that he missed this. I think it says a lot that he was too busy, and no one else was.